It's my pleasure today to be the moderator of this panel. My job is to bring out the best in our panelists, so we'll get to them right away. Just very quickly, I am involved with the United Inventors Association. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that's dedicated to inventor education. Uh, we're associated with many inventor organizations across the country, and we do a lot of trade shows and virtual education. Um, I'm going to get to uh, the next step here is to introduce our panel. We have three amazing panelists today. Carol Ann Carrington, Sherry Hammond, and Matt Nuccio. They all are independent uh, innovators and have done some amazing things. So why don't we start um, first, uh, starting with Carol Ann. Uh, Carol Ann, bring you on. And if you wouldn't mind taking a couple minutes of just telling everybody who you are and uh, what you're up to these days. Hello, my name is Carol Ann Carrington. And first, I'd like to say thanks for uh, being on the panel and presenting. Uh, some of my ideas and experiences to the audience. I am a mother, owner, and founder of Kicker Feast, a fruit-based and vegetable-based pancake and waffle mix. It's made with 100% fruit powder and vegetable powder, comes in four flavors, carrot, the initial flavor, blueberry, beet, and pumpkin. Just add water and the natural color and the natural flavor of each fruit or vegetable pops. Well, I can tell you from experience that they're really, really good. And you can make pancakes and waffles. Uh, so we're going to come back and ask more questions, but thanks for that introduction. And uh, if we can uh, change over to Sherry, how about you uh, saying hello and, and telling what you're up to these days? And thanks for having me. Um, my name is Sherry Hammond, and I am the co-founder of Inspired Product Development Group. And I'm in business with my father, and we invent products for the home that help make your daily tasks easier. We're specialized in storage and organization with a product called the Cabinet Caddy. It's a pull and rotate instant access organizer for your kitchen cabinets and your small spaces, as well as an, an, our newest product, which is Go Hang It, a picture hanging and leveling tool which identifies exactly where those nail holes need to go. And you can uh, measure or not measure, but you can mount those picture collages in minutes with zero measuring required. That's awesome. And where are you based, Sherry? Um, uh, we are based in Georgetown, Texas, which is just north of Austin. Awesome. And I should say, Sherry's, uh, I should say that uh, Carol Ann's up in Jersey near me. I'm in Connecticut, by the way. I know people like to enjoy that. Well, we're going to come back and find out some more details, but let's say hi to Matt Nuccio. Matt's an old friend. And uh, Matt, uh, I know what you know, you know what to, where to go now. Just tell us what's up and what you're doing. <laughs> okay, man, I don't even know who I am or what I'm doing here. How did I get invited? What am I doing? Um, <laughs> Yeah, my name is uh, Matt Nuccio. I am the owner of Design Edge, uh, designedge.net. We are a product development company that is essentially the back end to dozens of toy companies around the world. We design, we engineer, we prototype, we manufacture, we source, we do packaging, we do the whole kit and caboodle, everything behind it. And our clients range from, you know, the top toy companies in the world like Mattel and Hasbro and Spin Master down to the startups and, and, and individual inventors who are looking to launch on their own. That's awesome. And didn't you also invent Box of Joe with the? I I I worked on the Box of Joe. I didn't. I wish I wish I invented that. But I yeah, I did some of the engineering on that. We've worked on quite a few very unique things in, in our lifetime. Uh, Design Edge. Uh, our our clients are not exclusively toy, though we are very well known for it. But as I've joked before, and Warren, you've heard me say this before, but my clients range from Hasbro to Hooters. Well, I was once at a, an inventor conference once with Matt, and uh, they had about 10 box of Joes that you get at Dunkin' Donuts, those big 50 cup uh, coffee thing, and nobody knew how to open them. So Matt said, hey, I designed it. I'll open it. So it was pretty cool. We put a little post-it up, note up on them. But uh, so so we're, what I'd love, love to do is we're going to rotate around. We'll start with a different person each time. Sherry, we'll start with you. By the way, we, we have on the panel, obviously, someone in food, you know, someone in, in home goods, uh, hardware, home home furnishings, and we have someone in the toy industry or focuses on that. So we have a, a nice array here. But what we'll do is is start, um, Sherry, with you, if you don't mind. I'd like to go back to to really the beginning of where ideas come from and your initial ideation. We'll get into product development a little bit. But how do you and your dad come up with ideas and, and how do you vet them initially to see if you have anything? And do you come up with a lot of them and get rid of a lot of them quickly? Just tell us a little bit about the idea or the ideation process that you go through. Sure. 
Um, with the cabinet caddy, it came from like digging in my uh, spice cabinet and dropping spices out onto the floor and, and kind of just, I tend to be very unorganized anyway. And so there was a definite need there. And likewise with the, the go hang it, I was hanging a picture collage of my son's sports awards and stuff. And I ended up with like 50 holes in the wall. And then we thought there has to be a better way. And so what we want to do is we like to not invent the mousetrap, but build a better mousetrap. So we'll go and, and do our research and get all the organizational products or all the picture hanging products that are out there, play with them, use them, and really try to come up with something that's unique and uh, does a better job. And, and so when you do that, because I'm sure you get a lot of ideas, what early sounding board do you use to see if you're on? So I'm sure you do a little bit of research online. You're, you're obviously out there, like you said, looking at everything that's out in the marketplace. But who do you use as your early sounding board to give you some feedback? So we use friends and family, of course. Um, you know, I have a mom's group that I'm always bouncing ideas off of. And, you know, just like you said, we have probably five or six ideas in the pipeline at once and some rise to the top and some, you know, get pushed to the bottom and that's just the way it goes. Do you do, do you ever do any empirical testing, any, any survey monkey type of thing or any greater, bigger group, or, or is it pretty much in the, in the beginning, just, just that short, that small group that you work with? So we have not used any professional group like that. However, I will say, we tend to do when we're honing our pitch and really uh but it's after the product is made we'll go to those small local trade shows you know the yep i don't know the home shows and stuff and get a booth and really start working with it and showing it to people and and that's kind of more of a confirmation that you've got a great idea that is such a good idea and for our audience uh go to these home shows a lot of them are in local towns some of them are state fairs even if you don't have a product, go there and see what other people are doing or even go to trade shows, you know, industry trade shows. That, that, that is great. So, Matt, let's let's shift over to you. Uh, I know that you have, you know, a number of people working for you. You have a bit bigger operation. You, you must go through this all the time of coming up with cool ideas and then you have to shed them. Tell us a little bit about your process. Uh, and we're, I mean, we're different in a lot of respects because we work on, on timelines. So oftentimes we're we're, we're given a task and, and, and we have like two weeks to just like blue sky develop and just like run through tons of stuff. So uh, I live with a Sharpie in my hand. So it's like, I'm just, just sketching reams of paper and, you know, taping them to the wall. And then as a team, we review. Aren't they illegal in, in New York, Sharpies? No. Well, you know, I mean, I have a, I have a, I have a five Sharpie a day habit. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, pretty embarrassing, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get better. Don't worry. I'm going to kick tomorrow. Um, but when a company comes to you and says, hey, Matt, um, do they give you any parameters? Do they, because uh, I know you've been doing this for a long, since childhood, really, you know, how do they work? It's all over the place. So it depends on what it is. So in, in, in some of the cooler examples, we'll get like a movie script and I'll get locked in a room and the camera's on me and there's, you know, my name printed over every single page and I have to read through the movie script and we have to figure out how to make it uh, what's referred to as muy toyetic. So we have to figure out how to. Uh, improve upon that script to make sure that certain characters, uh, things that they use or elements about them are able to be added value in play. So, for instance, if a doll, if the main character is a female lead and she has short hair, we might recommend to make her hair longer so that it can be braided or something that can be done with it. Um, you know, other times it's, uh, you know, TV show concepts where, where, you know, there's a new hit TV show on a Nickelodeon or, or Disney and we're, one of our customers is trying to get the license from some say Disney or whatever. So we have to just, you know, come up with a whole bunch of ideas just to get them excited about it. And then other times it's it's a retail push. So currently the last few weeks we've been going crazy over here because uh, Walmart is reviewing uh, products for next year. So we've just been sharing out concept after concept to concept just for the buyers to review to see what they like. And then from there, once those are approved, then we have to start you know, design, ideating them and then designing them and then engineering them and then building them for cost and prototyping. And then it, it, it just it goes on and on. It takes about uh, anywhere from 12 months to 18 months to get it all done. 
So that takes a lot of experience and you, you, which you have, um, and I know you, some of them are, are generated by companies and, and the big retailers, but you also work with independent inventors and, and what do they just bring you ideas? And we're going to talk about development later, but at this point, do yeah. they bring up just ideas sometimes? Well, it's funny that you're the one who points out because initially we didn't, we didn't work with anyone outside for the, the longest time of designs, design ages existence. It wasn't actually until, uh, I got brought in on the United Inventors Association's board that I guess I got on people's radars and I started uh, getting a lot of people calling me and submitting stuff and wanting to show me stuff. So then, so nowadays, yes, we will take people's ideas, but it's on a very case by case uh, basis. You know, it's not easy to be a toy inventor and just because you have a cute idea doesn't mean it's a great idea. So, you know, we really have to feel it's a, it's a strong concept. And yes, if, if you've got something, we'll help you either license it or if you want to if you've got the, the means or the desire or you want to own a toy company, you want to start something, you know, we can become your back end. And that's that's becoming more the norm because now people can get onto Amazon, they can get onto Walmart.com and Target.com, and they can build a one item business and turn it into a two item business in three years or a four item business, which was next to impossible five years ago. You needed vendor numbers. You couldn't you couldn't just walk into Walmart and say, take my one item. It just wouldn't happen. So there's definitely a speed change uh, in what inventors are able to do and what they are doing now. And do you hold that against me that I got you involved with inventors? Or are you okay? I, every night I just sit there, I'm like, that damn Warren. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So Carol Ann, I, I have to say, I have a serious weakness here uh, because I was introduced to Carol Ann a, a few months ago and uh, I immediately ordered her product and I, 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 I love it. Carolyn, tell us in the beginning how you came up with your unique idea. And, and your your story is really cool because it's a lot of people think of inventors as, as hard goods, you know, like products that are in the home or toys. But you're you're in the food world, which is a little bit has a little bit a different twist to it. So tell us about how you came up with the idea. Yes, yeah. uh, I'm quite an accidental entrepreneur. And my idea actually came about when I was trying to get my son who was nine at the time to drink some freshly made carrot juice. He politely declined, but he wanted pancakes. So I just blended some of the carrot juice into the pancake mix and he gobbled them up unaware that he just ate carrot pancakes. And I just had this moment, why don't we have pancake mixes in natural colors and natural flavors? So I took my idea to the Small Business Development Center and they told me that I will have to create my own powder mix. I initially started with the organic idea and I was a little confused how to mass produce with the juices of fruits and vegetables. So what I did, I enrolled in culinary school at night in 2018 and it was there that I presented my idea to one of the culinary chefs who told me that I need to think in powder form. So I started out, he guided me to just go around, inquire with suppliers and ask for samples. Some samples were free, some you have to pay for them. And as I stated, I started with the intent of bringing out an organic pro product. What happened after I created the first batch and sent it to friends and family and you know, allowed some of my culinary friends to um, classmates to test the product. Uh, with, I needed to tweak it. And then one of the major ingredients I had run out of, and when I inquire for um, some more over um, product, which was a sample pack, the supplier told me that I had received overage and they were unable to give me more because it was from a specialized order and the minimum order quantity was 7,500 pounds. So that made me switch from organic to a regular mix. <laughs> That's how the process started. Hey, let me just follow up with you for a second on the SBDC. I think you titled it. So, so that sounds like a great resource for inventors, entrepreneurs to check out. Sounds like they were very helpful to you. Was that your experience? Yes, they were. Um, the Small Business Development Center, the Small Business Administration, um, all the resources out there that are free, you need to utilize them. I went to a lot of seminars um, and, and networking 
was an option, although I, I met very few people who had a similar idea, but it's still great because you meet graphic designers, you can meet um, anyone, you know, who can help you in certain aspects of your idea or lead you in the direction or connect you with others. So that's, all, that's awesome. That's awesome. And just a little plug here. There are inventor organizations slash sort of clubs across the country that meet regularly and another resource besides the uh, SBDC and the SBA and others. And they're great organizations to join and, and uh, to get feedback and, and information. So, so we're going to start this time with Matt and we're going to, we're going to go from now. We've talked a little bit about your original idea, how you got the idea where it generated from. Now we, we know the next step is to actually start to build one or put one into existence so that you can check it. Matt, tell us a little bit about prototyping, what your experience is there, and and uh, do you prototype everything, or just tell us a little bit about your your next step in the process. We definitely prototype the majority of everything that we do. You know, there's very few items that are so self-evident that we can go straight to production. Um, so our first phase is a a functions like prototype where we want to just sort of prove the theory of whatever it does and that can be cobbled together with toilet paper tubes duct tape you know grandma's old watch i mean whatever whatever required to to get what you needed to do and once you've built that prototype and it functions the way that you want it to do you know then you know depending on what's required you know actually once you've got a proof of concept that's when you really want to get Sort of engaging in, in, the, in the patenting process if that's something that you're going to do uh, but the next phase of that would be you know we do design it and then we then would further engineer it and do a, it looks like functions like prototype uh, and that's you know basically our process but yeah a lot of frankensteining a lot of grabbing so you, for this and that and just slapping them together yeah in the beginning even if it doesn't look right you want to make sure it works it functions right i mean i i get a lot of submissions i also run up in innovation programs for several companies of just sort of uh, CADs or, or drawings and things. I, I always, when I get back to people, a lot of times they haven't built one. I mean, yeah, you- that's scary, that's very scary. Yeah, I, I get that often too from, uh, you know, people trying to break into inventing. It's, it can be a huge waste of money to, you know, go and CAD everything up and, and never have a prototype. I mean, seriously, prototyping should be your, your after your initial like wet napkin sketch at the bar at 3 a.m., your next phase after you wake up hungover is to build that prototype. Yeah. Well, uh, it always amazes me that some people are even taught to do that. So uh, anyway, but but uh, Sherry, let's 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 go to you. I'm, I'm sure you spent a lot of time building building prototypes. We talked a little bit about your ideas, your 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 initial friends, family, club, the, the women's club, and so forth. Your dad and all that. Uh, tell tell us a little bit more next about about how you go from ideation to actual function. So. You know, again, you dad always says there's a 10 foot radius. You can anything in a 10 foot radius can can create a prototype that kind of functions and everything. You just kind of look around, like you said, and and build your initial prototype. And then and then we take those and sketch them out. And then we take them to a company that actually does the CAD for us. And then from there, we have SLA models done. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, 3D printing has really come a long way and it's, it's a real nice thing to have as an inventor in your pocket. And so we get our SLA prototypes done. One of the things that we do is we send parts of our products to different SLA people so that they don't have the drawings of the whole item. And so that helps us not get knocked off, at least. So, at least. so tell us, go in a little bit more into depth about, about CADs. For those who, who are new, because some of our, our viewers are new to this process, this is CAD stands for Computer Assisted Drawing, of which I met the inventor of CAD. But in any event, that's another story for another day. But And then how, how you switch that into actually building the model out, the SLA. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. So we take our crude prototypes and, and our sketches and everything to a company. We use a company called Propulsion here in Austin, and we've worked with them for a long time. and. They are brilliant at really capturing our concepts and putting it, putting the drawings into CAD. Um, it's, they do every little detail, you know, down to the minutiae. And then from there, that's when you do your initial prototype. 
and the prototypes will let you know what you need to tweak if you need to adjust a latch or a pull or a you know a cam or something like that on on the actual product. Um, they also build in tolerances for molds. You know they'll often make latches really loose so that once you get to the mold, you can kind of tighten them up and and make them uh, snap the way you want. Get an audible snap or or a good a nice feel as you're using it. And isn't it cool to watch things get built on rapid prototype, right? And, uh, you know, eight mm -hmm. hours later, you have one, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, very cool. So, uh, Sherry, we'll get back to, to you. So your process is a little bit different, but we ended last with you talking about uh, all the, the number of uh, pounds of material in, in you had and so forth. Tell us a little bit more about how the functional part, I guess for your, for you, function is taste, right? It had to... Um, you probably went through lots of iterations before it actually tasted right, right? Tell us a little bit about the food process of getting a functional prototype going. Well, yes. Um, you know, you have to do trial and error. You have to get the right balance, the right flavor, the right texture, the right color. So, you know, I was fortunate that as I created each batch, I was not only did I know what I was looking for, but being in culinary school at night, I had the opportunity to give my samples to some of the culinary students and my professor, my culinary chef, he was very, very helpful in, you know, helping me with taste balance and color and everything. But it, it is really a trial and error. I sent samples to friends and family with a survey, what they thought about the taste, the texture, the color, what they would enhance anything. And based on the feedback I received, I would tweak it. And as I said, I had started off with organic. So everything after um, that had to be rested to get the regular mix. But, so now you, you have a, the unusual challenge then of, of uh, hopefully you have good taste. Most chefs, of course, have good taste yourself, so you know where to start. But then you have the challenge of then uh putting in a beautiful packaging right that's a big part of your presentation tell us a little bit about how you went through that how did you decide how much goes in there how did you cost that out so that would be profitable for you well the um i i was fortunate to meet a graphic designer through networking again i went to a seminar and um met a banker and why conversing with him i was telling him i need a graphic designer and he had just spoken to one so he was kind enough to give me the name of the person who then introduced me to my graphic designer. I had an idea of how I wanted the package um, to, to look. The prototype really packaging had a window. So I wanted to continue that whole style because the uniqueness about my pancake and waffle mix is that it has color. So the powder mix of the beet shows a pinkish. The blueberry has that blue tint and carrot and pumpkin, of course, has a very similar yellowish tint. And so, so that was my idea because, you know, we shot with our eyes and visibility was one of the things that I wanted to distinguish my packaging and my mix from others. And so tell us a little bit about the type of information you have to put on the package in order to make it, I guess, FDA safe. I mean, you have to go through a certain protocol. Tell us a little bit about that process and what's involved. Oh, yes. So once your mix is uh, to your satisfaction, you have to send it to a lab, uh, which is FDA regulated test. So it can be tested and follow the guidelines of the nutritional label and ingredients. So based on that they would provide you with the final um layout you present the layout but they would give you all the calories um intake and everything they, they actually make the nutritional labels for you you have to get your barcodes uh, which is from the gs IU, G, GSIU, I believe, or I, maybe I'm saying it wrong, but barcodes, you have to research everything. You have to make sure that everything that goes into the product is labeled. So that is all, as I said, it's sent to the lab where it's tested and then it's sent back to you where you send it to the graphic designer who would incorporate that into the package before it goes to off to the printer. 
Now, did you have your lawyer uh, review all that so that everything, you know, you don't want to make a mistake, right? <laughs> Well, the lawyer did not review the packaging, but a lawyer is definitely needed for a contract. I will tell anyone. Yeah. I utilized the the help of a co-packer, so I definitely had my attorney reviewing contracts because one word can alter your liability. Now we're going to come back and talk about contracts in a minute, so hold that thought. But but I just wondered if you wanted to make sure that you know every all the I's were dotted, T's were crossed on your packaging before it went out, because once it goes. To market, you know, you're you don't have to recall them, but anyway, that's a but I did. I, I actually, um, three of my packaging were incorrect due to a minor error, so that had to be done. And it's very disheartening when unforeseeable financial um errors have such an impact on you. So, yeah, it's very, very important to have a review process. Well, sorry you had to go through that. So I know we're a little bit off the original subject, but I want to continue on with that because, Matt, I know you have a lot of experience unpackaging. Let's continue the packaging theory. I mean, I'm looking at your wall behind you, which I assume are all products that you you brought to market. Tell us a little about, about packaging and the importance of it. Well, actually, my degree is in packaging. I have a degree in package design. Studying packaging. Your, your high school degree? My I don't have a high school degree. I'm talking about middle school. <laughs> now, uh, no, my my college degree is uh, from the Fashion Institute of Technology, wow. uh, Manhattan FIT, in package design, and it was a uh, it was a tough program. Actually, they only accepted twenty of us uh, out of all the people that applied. It was the only school in the nation at the time that had a package design major as well. Um, yeah, packaging is. It's, I mean, it's your front line. It, 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 it's it's where everything happens, right? It, it tells the story. It has to tell the story in a split second. There are, you know, different regulations depending on the industries that you're in, different types of warnings, scaling of things. But first and foremost, you know, it has to be legible. It has to be, it has to tell that story in a split second. If it doesn't, it's it's a failure of a package. And I see far too often extremely beautiful packages that don't communicate whatsoever. They're just designed for an aesthetic to look nice in someone's portfolio or or or, or in someone's cabinet, but totally ineffective at a retail level. Just because something is gorgeous doesn't mean it communicates. And, uh, you know, I have a long history of dating that proves that. <laughs> so, um, so a little bit more, and you're into packaging. So uh, I've been, I've read before where you have less than two seconds to get a customer's attention on the selling floor. So if someone's like at Bed Bath & Beyond, they're walking down the aisle, they either see it, pop, go to it, or or they move on, right? So, so what are some of your tricks? Do you use color? Uh, do you do you use the size of your 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 name and graphics? Do you use the name of the product? What what do you I use mean, to get people? It really starts with with the name of the product, right? And I think when you're naming a product, you should really keep in mind how it's going to look aesthetically. Um, if you've got a product that's got a really it, 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 it's a loud type of concept or it's something that needs to be in somebody's face, I honestly recommend that you use you pick words that have you know, straight looking letters, K's and T's and H's and, and, you know, if you've got a softer product, you want to, and, and you pick, you're picking a name, perhaps you want to pick words that have more rounded, like S's and O's and Q's and stuff, because visually, even if you can't read that word, the, the, those shapes alone communicate. Um, I, I know that's a, that's it can be very cerebral and hard perhaps to put your head around, but really from day one, you know, just because something sounds cool, in audio, it doesn't mean it looks cool and visual. And when you're coming up with the name of a product, you really should do the study in both forms. So Slinky has a K in it, but no T, right? So, <laughs> but but no, it's really cool. But when you go through actually naming the product, I mean, do you go through hundreds of names before you settle on one, or how does that process it's, work? It's arduous, right? I mean, there are times when I'm like, I'm I'm done. I'm done working on names of this thing. You know, you, you have lists that go for days and. You know, you know, getting a consensus of people to agree. I mean, I, I, it's hard enough to get three people to agree on dinner, right? Uh, to, then to get like a, you know, a, I, I don't know. I suddenly had this vision of like you and Sam Kennison staying up through the night, you know. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> some assistances of some of uh, some some carrot flavored powders. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we, uh, yeah, no, it, it it it's it's it can be very difficult, and it's hard to settle. And then, of course, you know, we're, we're, we're who were we speaking before? This is the USPTO. 
What yeah. happens next? You finally found that awesome name, and guess what? It doesn't clear. <laughs> you can't get the trademark. You can't get a trademark for it. All right. Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to go to IP next, but let me bring back in Sherry. Sherry, I want to double back on where we ended with you last and, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, as you go from ideation to product and as you're developing, have you gotten to a, a point in the process where you built a prototype, where you've done a little more vetting, and you said, this just isn't working, and you drop the project and move on to someone? Tell us about some of your failures that never made it to market when it comes to that. So since Inspired Product Development Group has been around, which we just um, got that DBA in 2017, that actually hasn't happened to us yet. So. Um, but there have years ago, my dad is a serial inventor. He has about 150 patents under his belt. But there have been other products that definitely, like you said, you prototype and you get and, and it really comes down to usability. Um, is it something that people you feel that people will actually use? For instance, my dad was working on a balance product once. And the, he, he thought it was great and, and everything. But when we went to our friends and family, you know, it just didn't end up being something that they felt that they could use. So we did have to scrap that one. But that was when I worked for him a long time ago, back in the 90s. But, uh, well, but tell us, luckily, we haven't tell, had that problem. Tell us a little bit more about your relationship with your dad. I, I have three daughters, so I, I um, uh, spent a lot of time um I'm growing up. Did, did you, were you kind of like, uh, you know, I asked Caroline this next, so like at your father's side, so sometimes chefs, children, you know, work with them, become great chefs. Were you like in the lab when, or in the basement with your dad when he was inventing and you took an interest? Tell us a little bit about your story there. Absolutely. Um, my dad was an IBM engineer, mechanical engineer um, with the business machines before they went to computers. And as a hobby, he started out doing woodworking, you know, building and designing things out of wood. And that turned into, um, you know, 20 kiosks in the malls in Texas. And from there, he took early retirement from IBM when they did switch and then developed a, a product called Disc Gear. And I'm actually on that patent for the, for, there was a little title sheet that organized your names and all that kind of stuff. And, and I was able to, that was my first patent and I was 19 years old. But he, we're not a family that sits and watches a lot, sits and watches a lot of TV or something like that. We never had like a gaming system in our house. Um, we live out in the country. We were always out and doing things, fixing things, working on things, and doing things. And and he really spent a lot of time with me and my brother to make sure that when we grew up, we know how to do stuff. And that was just having us right alongside him and my mother. Uh, she taught me how to paint and really brought up my creative side. Um, I ended up being uh, the creative director for uh, a medium-sized company here in Austin, Texas. So that, that all those influences really helped define me. And now I get to go back to the number one person that you know has been my mentor uh, all this all this time and work with him. And I've just really enjoyed working with my dad that's pretty awesome. much my whole life. That's awesome. By the way, I've learned a tremendous amount from my three daughters. So I'm sure you've taught him a lot as well. So so let's switch gears a little bit into intellectual property. Now you've uh, we've talked about ideation a little bit. We've talked about product development, a little bit about packaging. Tell us a little bit about how when you think you're onto something, you start investing in a patent, utility patents. Do you, I'm assuming you file utility patents. Just tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll go around the room on that subject. Sure. So as soon as we realize that we're on to something and we get prototypes and we use it, we start thinking about names and trademarking and uh, copywriting. And um, I always say, get that provisional patent in ASAP because that really gets you in the door and gets you started with some protection. Could you tell um, people what a provisional, could you describe what a provisional patent is for everybody? Um, definitely in layman's terms. So. A uh, provisional patent is just letting the USPTO know that you've got this product and your intent is to file a utility patent for it. That's mm -hmm. my my understanding anyway. And um, all, all of our products uh, tend to have a great look and feel. So we also do design patents yep. as well. Um, so 
we have all the bases covered. And initially, when we started in 2017, of course, funds were really tight. And so I would log on to the USPTO and file as a micro entity, you yep. know, myself. And it's a challenging process, but, you know, just a little wherewithal and kind of going through step by step, you can definitely get it done. Yeah. And so micro entities are described as small businesses. So independents and small businesses, which is a lower filing fee, which is great. Uh, and provisional patents. Uh, are early, uh, they, they really became important in 2013 with the passage of the American Invents Act that uh, we were no longer first to invent or keep a notebook. And um, so so now it's important to get in the line and by filing a 12 month PPA and a reduced price, you can get in line. And I'm sure that uh, much of this conference with the USPTO will describe what that is, but 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 thanks. Uh, so let's, let's, let's switch sips back to food now, okay? And uh, talk about, you know, now, by the way, let me just summarize this. There's utility patents and there's design patents. Utility patents are specifically for a function, a lot of times with home goods, a, an actual mechanical um, piece of the invention, which can be described. Design patents are more what it looks like or, or unique uh, features, uh, visual features of the product. Um, Caroline, let's talk about a little bit about about food. What are do you file utility patents? Uh, do you did what what did you file exactly? Trade secrets. Tell us a little bit about the process you went through. Well, the only thing I filed was a tra my trademark. I trademarked my name, <laughs> Kicker Feast. Okay. I actually the company is called Colorful Eats, and yeah. in my attempt to trademark that name, my attorney told me it would not be accepted. There was too many hashtags with the name on social media that referenced food. So uh, I had to then come up with a name and that process was uh, quite a while before it just dawned on me. Why don't we just call it kicker feast because we're kicking off our breakfast, lunch or dinner with a feast of pancakes or waffles. So I was surprised that the name was available and I trademarked that name. So that was the most important thing to you is trademark, but is was there anything you could do to protect your special blend that all that work you put into getting just the right taste so that nobody else could copy that? Well, my recipe is not that difficult. It's not like KFC. It doesn't, you know, we're trade secret. Um, so I didn't decide I decided not to pursue that route. Not at all. Okay. All right. Well, well, let's let's uh, Matt. I, I know you have a lot of experience with this. I'm sure you've done design patents. I'm sure you've done all types of. Tell us a little about your IP. And do you have a, like a regular IP attorney you work with, or how do, how does how the process work of yes, protecting it? Yeah, I do. I have a regular. I use a guy named Frank Sardone. He's very good and uh, very reasonable. So Frank, you're getting a shout out on the USPTO site. So uh, good for you. Um, I know most of your attorneys. So. Uh, <laughs> so. What was I was going to say, um, yes, patents, the toy industry is a little strange because it is a, unlike a lot of other industries, it is a fashion business, right? So we oftentimes, uh, a product has a life of less than a year. So it's possible for a patent to not even be issued before this product is, is, is already on its descent. Um, but of course, if you have a unique mechanism inside of that toy that can be utilized for other things, you're going to want to patent it. If you've got, you know, something that truly can be redone or reapplied or, or, or obviously shows signs that it can, it can have a long shelf life, um, you know, by all means. But what really becomes important in the toy industry is trademarking because that once a product, when all, all that money has been put into, you know, making a toy successful for that 12 months, well, then that name has become uh, a brand to itself to which other products will fall under that umbrella. So the trademark can be worth more than the original concept. Especially in your area, where does where do utility patents come in? I mean, do you do would half the products you develop have utility patents or a small percentage? Um, how does that work? Um, no, I mean it's it's it's. I mean, you'd be surprised how little patenting is done in the in the sure. toy industry. You know, and it really depends on the category. You know, it, it it can change a lot. You know, like electronics and and you know heavy mechanism toys. Yeah, utility. But there's a lot of design patents too. You know, you've got a, a you stylize a doll, right? That that is the look, right? That you that that you want a design patent because yeah. you want someone to to knock off the way that that doll looks. That doll has zero function other than the way it looks. 
So that's really, well, that's, that's really interesting. I will say that toys, each industry, toys, hardware, housewares, medical products, food, every single industry is a little bit different when it comes to IP. And it does seem to me that toys um, does not depend as much on IP as I will say, like the hardware houseware space. Um, we're going to go one more time around. And I'm going to start opening up questions to the floor. We've talked about ideation. We've talked about product development. We've talked about building a functioning prototype. We've talked about a little bit about IP. Let's talk about going to market now. And Sherry, we'll come back to you. We'll go around one more time, then we'll open up the questions. So now you've got all these things done. You've come up with a great idea. Um, you vetted it to your women's club. You've, you've gotten good feedback from your friends and family, your dad, are work, and you are working on it. You figured out how to make it. It seems like you can make it for the right price. You built one. It all functions. It all works. You patented it. Tell us a little bit about your next step. Do you usually go to market directly with your products yourself, or do you license it to a bigger company? Just tell us how you get it on the shelf. So we have chosen to take the products to market ourselves. And as a matter of fact, our goal is to take one new product to market each year. And um, it's definitely challenging, but we have the relationships with the manufacturer and I do the packaging design and um, marketing. We have a real small team that we're able to do much of it ourselves. We have a strong presence online at different online retailers, um, which has actually come in handy during this pandemic. So, um, but we're, we're just now getting big enough to where we can get into the inline stores where we have an established product that has good reviews and all that kind of stuff. So. When you say now, do you use Amazon or do you use, or do you just do your own marketing, go directly through your website? Tell us how, how that works uh, on your own. So we initially started out doing those trade shows um, while trying to get our business online with Amazon. And we, of course, we have our own website. Um, Amazon is a unique beast where it's kind of a snowball effect. You've got to get kind of the algorithm going and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, it really takes some time, but it's a great place to be able to hone your pitch, your graphics, and, and all that kind of stuff as well, as well as the trade shows. Um, and then from there, you go to larger trade shows. Like with the Go Hang It product, I had the opportunity to pitch to Home Depot at IHA. Um, the last one that they had before the pandemic and they oh, love the product and <laughs> they love the product and we got we got in home depot.com and we're currently in talks with them to uh bring it in store so it's pretty exciting stuff not to not to put a self-serving pitch in here but the united inventors association runs the inventor trade pavilion at the hardware show and it's the biggest uh, vendor booth pavilion in the country with pitch panels. And we'll be back out there at the end of October this year for, for those who have hardware products. Just, just check us out, the United Inventors Association. So, Carol Ann, let's, let's move to, to you. Let's, let's talk about your path to market. You've done all these things, all the hard work. Now comes showtime, right? I mean, you put it out there. Where are you selling? Are you at gourmet stores? Are you at big stores? Have you gone to any food trade shows? Tell us a little bit about getting to market. Yes, well, I launched online because I launched during the pandemic. So I'm on Shopify and uh, that has been, it has its moments. Yeah. But now that the, yeah, now, now that the, um, now that we're reopening to, you know, human contact, I've been fortunate to get into a few gourmet stores um, within my neighborhood. And um, I'm also visiting a lot of farmers market. So that is my initial vi visibility to get the product, you know, known. And um, do, do you have certain customers that you track that like order weekly? <laughs> uh, well, those, yeah, um, not weekly, but occasionally. Yeah, they, all of that is measured through um, Shopify algorithms. So yeah, that's, that's what's wonderful about food. It gets eaten and reordered. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah. So, so Matt, maybe maybe you could, since we have two examples of going to market directly, just talk for a couple of minutes about licensing. I know you you do go to market in a variety of ways, but do you do a lot of licensing agreements with these big toy companies? Yeah, I've uh, yeah. We besides yeah, you know, obviously we design and engineer for many toy companies, but I also invent stuff on my own. And then, then and develop it on my own and license it to toy companies. And we've been nominated for, for Toy of the Year four times. 
which is sort of, if anyone's unaware, it's our equivalent to the Academy Award, the, the Oscar, Grammy, you know, that's, uh, yeah, we, we do licensing deals. And so uh, how do you, do you have a standard protocol? Do you have an attorney that helps you negotiate them? Where do you, or I know, you, where did you start? I mean, you've learned along the way, but but uh, where'd you learn what you've learned about how to negotiate a good licensing deal? Oh, I learned in my wallet. That's where I learned. <laughs> it's, uh, my bank account kept getting smaller and smaller, and I realized I was doing things incorrectly. Um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's gotten to the point now, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm suggesting things to the lawyer, but, you know, early on, yeah, you don't know. You know, the one, the, the one thing I see that, the most often is that inventors that come to me and are like, well, you know, this guy's offered five percent, but this guy's offered ten percent, so I'm going to go with the ten percent, and I'm I'm like ten percent of what? Yeah, you know that's that's the I can give you a contract for fifty percent, you'll make less than five percent on another deal. It's the definitions or everything when it comes to licensing. Yeah, I can name that tune in three notes, right? Yeah. And then, you know, and then people get out, you know, and the other thing I see constantly post is so-and-so got an option or so-and-so got a, uh, uh, you know, just sign a licensing deal. You can, I could sign a licensing deal every single day if I wanted to. They're not that hard to get. Getting a good one, on the other hand, is next to impossible. And with the right company and with a reputable company or the company that's going to put it out there. And there are many warning signs of bad, yeah. of, of bad companies to work with. And, and you know, and then this, I mean, they're written all over the world, but a lot of, so inventors just want to just want to say that they've um, they've done a licensing deal. It, it's like how many movies about Motown artists have you seen where they you know sign that horrible contract because they want to be famous and then thirty years later they're, they're they're destitute, you know? And it's the same thing with inventors. They'll they'll go and sign a horrible contract just because they want to show their friends that they did a deal, and they'll 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 net nothing off of it. You and know, I think it's, it's so it's important uh, to say that that uh, you see these. Uh, ads on social media sometime that a licensee deal was signed and i've done many 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 of them and many of them don't amount to anything at the end of the day and uh, they're not properly prepped to go to market to begin with but uh, so i'll put another shameless plug I, I i wrote a book called inventor confidential um if anybody wants to read it i spend a lot of time on licensing what licensing deals look like inventor confidential so what we're going to do now over the last 10 minutes because time is flying here is we have some questions that have come in from our audience and I'm going to go down and and uh, you know and, and move these around. So so um, so let's start first with Carol Ann. Carol Ann, here's a question that came in. Um, what are some of the unique ways that you've increased awareness of your brand? Uh, a brand is important to you. You've you trademarked the name. What are you doing to to get the word out about about your brand? Uh, well, social media is is. It's a must, you know, um, Instagram, Facebook, friends and family um, shows, you know, little pop-up shows and everything. And the pandemic has really stifled the process. Uh, I mean, now it's, it's reopening. So everyone out there, tell your friends and families to come to Kicker Feast and try our pancake mix. <laughs> Are you good at social media? Are you naturally good at it? Or have you had to work at it? Or do you have a daughter like I do that does your social media for you? <laughs> I do social media. I do not like it. So I definitely am looking for someone who enjoys email marketing. It's a very challenging process. It's really, really important. So, uh, so Sherry, let's move over to you. The next question I think is more up your alley. Um, you mentioned taking your products to, to uh, home shows. Uh, this is a novice inventor who's curious to know. Uh, how do you develop your prototypes? We already talked about that a little bit, but uh, going specifically from prototype to production, um, when you, how do you know how many to make? Are you putting up your own money for the inventory? Tell us a little bit about that process as you make the decision of actually going to these shows and going to market. Yeah, so uh, my dad and I, you know, he actually took his IRA to start this company out. He cashed in his IRA. And um, I put a second mortgage on my home in order to get the molds done for our initial product. And having that established relationship with our manufacturer that we've known for over 30 years, he gave us great terms. So that allows the whole product life cycle to be a little bit easier for us because we manufacture in China. So once we get the molds done, you know, it's 50%, you know, he gives us good terms where we have to pay half of it when it ships. And then we have negotiated terms after that. So 
so that that helps us out it's it's about relationships and and you want to find i always i always say that you want to trust your gut you know when you meet people and you have relationships and with people you meet people at trade shows manufacturers and everything i really trust my gut and you know and if i get a, an uneasy feeling then you know we tend to go somewhere else but but it gosh aside from prototyping and and being self-funded you know it's we really don't do business as usual i would say here so but tell us, tell us, a, us. let me let me digress let me take an offshoot from that okay. tell us a little bit about the supply chain these days and we, we're not going to get into it oh that's left but uh containers 24 containers that are um were three thousand dollars and now i understand about twenty thousand dollars has that impacted your business and pricing and tell us for a, sec a minute or two about that if you wouldn't mind it sure has. Last year, we were able to get containers. First of all, now that we're big enough, we we only bought a 20 foot container once, and then after that, it's always been 40 foot. You need to maximize that landed cost as much as possible, and get as many in a container as you can. And um, so, but last year, I think we got containers for six thousand eight hundred dollars, and then the beginning of this year, it went up to ten eight, and then the last one I uh, last one I got quoted for seventeen for a 40 foot high cube. And so I'm I'm certain it's gone up since since then, but yes, we had to go and raise our our prices across the board and go to all the people and say, hey, I'm sorry, you know, and we'll honor any purchase orders that have been um, given to us up until, you know, you have to contact everybody, give them a date, and say after that the price is going to be this because it's just really cutting into the bottom line. Well, well, nothing but horror stories there. So. Uh... All right, Matt, we're going to finish up with you on one, but I'm going to take one question myself real quick. Um, this is a gentleman who writes from uh, Nigeria, which is really exciting. We have someone from Africa listening in today. Uh, it's a very inventive society but with low invention capacity. Hearing this panel, he says he's thinking about the challenge that we lack in the invention ecosystem infrastructure, things like CAD designs, graphic designers, and so forth. Uh, how important do you think these things are and what advice would you get? I'm just going to answer this for myself and then Matt, we're going to finish with you. Um, very important. All of it's very important. So here's what you're going to do. Send me an email, www.tuttle at yahoo.com. Uh, I spent a good part of my book, Inventor Confidential, talking about this and why it's important. And we can follow up with you offline because that's a big time question for those around the world that are listening in. We'd love to give you more, more information and help on that. So Matt, um, I, how many products have you brought to market in the hundreds, right? Um, how many are, are on the market today? And uh, how do you manage all that just as an individual? <laughs> wow. Um, we work on a ridiculous amount of products every single year. So, I mean, there's thousands of products that, at this point that throughout our uh, 30 years, I mean, we've got a you know, it, it's quite a few. Uh, how many are on the market right now? A lot, more than I can count. Um, to date, I've never walked into a toy store and not found something that we worked on. You know, and that, that includes going to CVS and Walgreens and, and Bob and Pops and, you know, the majors. You know, we work on so many iconic brands and we work with some of the largest companies in the world. You know, you're going to find Hasbro toys in every single toy, toy store, you know, and then yeah. also, you know, Early on in my career, you know, we worked on some major, major hits over the years, including Pogs and Tickle Me Elmo and, and you know, the, the Power Glove and, and like all these, you know, really big, big, big items, iconic items. Um, so, yeah. So how do I manage that? Uh, liquid courage. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, we'll, we'll uh, to, to, to end up, we're, we're ending our time here. Matt Nuccio with Design Edge. Um, Google him if you've got some in the toy world that you need help on. Uh, Sherry and Carolyn, and just Carolyn, how do people get in touch with you if they if they wanted to uh, email you? What's your email address? <laughs> My email is info at colorfuleatsusa.com. That's great. If anybody has that, and uh, Sherry, how about yours? So mine's Sherry S H A R I at Inspired. PDG product development group.com. And I'm uh, under tuttleinnovation.com. So, uh, Sean, thanks so much. Dennis, thanks so much for having us today. If anybody wants to reach out and get in touch with us, we 
we only uh, we love helping people. So thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So thank much. you, Warren, Carol Ann, Sherry, and Matt. Thank you for providing all that information, and we look forward to hearing from you and everybody. Reach out to them. They've provided their information, so I encourage you to take advantage of that.